the concept of a trading card is one of the coolest ideas ever. One rectangle of cardboard has the potential to contain more utility, value, and power than anything near its size and simplicity. In one way, it's like a piece from a board game, except the game you're playing is spread across years worth of expansions, and the unique pieces you choose to play with create your own styles and strategies, almost an extension of yourself. This makes the cards valuable game pieces, but the specific characters depicted on the cards add value in a different way, turning them into collectibles. It's this combination of utility, collectability, and also scarcity that's responsible for some of the most coveted items in history, and trading cards are no exception. And to top it off, their comparably small footprint makes them easy to buy, sell, trade, collect, and of course play with. That is the core appeal of TCGs. But personally, I'm more interested in their other facets, which I didn't even mention yet. And one of them is their lore. Now, when it comes to lore and world building in a card game, the undisputed king is Magic the Gathering. Magic's 30 years of storylines have played out across a vast tapestry of worlds, each with their own creatures, environments, and histories. Expansions focus on specific worlds or story arcs, which players discover through the elaborate artworks, the mechanics themselves, a broad spectrum of flavor text, official web articles, and even novels. But Magic is still just a card game, so it almost has to do all this. The vast majority of TCGs are based on existing properties, which not only have established lore of their own, but may limit how much these spin-offs can deviate from it. One of these is, of course, Pokémon. The Pokémon trading card game uses various forms of storytelling, which I'll divide into three categories. First, there's your basic run-of-the-mill card, a creature in a generic environment. If there wasn't a Pokémon, it could be from anything. So there's also cards that contain elements from other Pokémon media, like the video games or movies, which is a type of lore, since it expands on that stuff's world, but it isn't its own thing. So the third category is for new lore. Not just cameos or connected arts, truly unique locations, stories, and characters, which should be the most interesting to examine. You'll find examples of each of these lore types throughout the series' history, with some of the unique stuff being fairly obscure until now. And I'll also be explaining where some products even came from, as there's some curious cases there as well. With that said, let's dive into the history of Pokémon card lore. When it comes to the Pokémon themselves, there's never been a new exclusive form or anything for the TCG, so everything story-wise depends on the background. The first Pokémon almost didn't have backgrounds, which was supposed to incite the feeling of owning the Pokémon, but without that context, there'd be no setting and no lore. But cards with these stock photo backgrounds are similarly unhelpful beyond basic theming, so we'll be ignoring them. Even still, the sets from the original series are ostensibly basic in design, but considering Pokémon came from this, and had just started to look like this, it was surreal to see them so fleshed out and living in lifelike environments. In Jungle, Fossil, and Team Rocket, the theming is obvious and simple, but that's really all that's needed to give a set its identity, and these classic artworks culminate to form a vibrant picture of this new Pokémon world. However, there won't be any secret lore to uncover for a while yet. The following Gym Leader sets are composed almost entirely of Pokémon on stock backgrounds, although the Gym angle does give it some proximity to the Core series. But the real standout in that area is the Vending series. These cards were only distributed in Japan from special vending machines, and came out in between their Rocket and Gym expansions. Each sheet represents a different area from the Gen 1 games, which is clearly reflected in the artwork. There's Pokémon from Viridian Forest, Mount Moon, the Safari Zone, the Rock Tunnel, the Power Plant, the Seafoam Islands, Cinnabar Island, and more. We wouldn't see another game-accurate set like this for quite some time, so this series was certainly special. But wait, aren't we forgetting something? Another type of Pokémon card that isn't a Pokémon? 
Ah yes, the energy cards, the, the trainer cards. These bring an additional layer of depth to a set's identity, and were some of the first Pokemon media to depict items, people, and places outside of the video games. One of these would even end up unwittingly exclusive to the TCG, Imposter Professor Oak. This seemingly random DeviantArt OC debuted in Base Set and again in Team Rocket. It wouldn't be until 20 years later that Imposter Oak's origins were revealed, in the now infamous leak of Pokemon Gold and Silver Space World demo. The game contains data for this NPC, who has no actions or dialogue, but does have a matching name and full set of sprites that match his appearance in the card game. Considering this demo was compiled in November 1997, the same month Team Rocket was published in Japan, we can assume Imposter Oak was fully intended to appear in Gold and Silver, but was scrapped by 1999. Despite this, he received another new card in 2001 with Imposter Oak's invention, and was even reprinted in 2021 celebrations. The Gen 2 Neo series is pretty devoid of lore, barring the occasional game or movie reference. You could count Dark Pokemon and Light Pokemon, but the only background we learn about them is that Dark Pokemon come from evil trainers and Light Pokemon come from nice ones. And then there's cosmetic differences like Shining Pokemon, but again, they don't really add to the lore. Luckily, we also got the Southern Islands Collection. No, not that one. It's actually the first unique location in the TCG, albeit with zero backstory to explain it. All we know is that there's two islands, Tropical Island and the Pikachu-shaped Rainbow Island, each with three scenes divided into cards. I already broke them down in my Neo Cameos video if you'd like a closer look. Well, technically this set was created before the Neo era in Japan, and used the original card design, so we should be grouping it with the original series. That's not all Gen 2 has to offer though. Pokemon vs. was a Japanese exclusive expansion composed of owner's Pokemon like the gym sets, but focused on the Johto gym leaders and even Elite Four. After that, the true E-Card era would begin, and we'd get another exclusive region in the form of Aquapolis. Well, actually two regions, whose sets were combined for the English release. I touched on this in my E-Series cameos, but now I'd like to go even deeper. The first location, in the town on no map, is a traditional port city. At the center is a prominent clock tower, which is visible on the most number of cards. There's also a water canal that runs through the city, reminiscent of Venice, along with a fountain and a lighthouse at the end of the harbor. But surprisingly, we actually have artwork of this entire region thanks to Pokemon Card Trainers Magazine, an official Japanese publication that ran from 1999 to 2003 and gave exclusive insight into many aspects of the Pokemon TCG. From this illustration, we can see the clock tower, canal, and lighthouse, plus greener spaces outside the town, which correspond to the park setting found in many other cards, and possibly a mountain range as well. The only place not pictured here is the unmanned power plant, embodied by the stadium card. Also in the magazine is early concept art for the town area, which looks almost futuristic compared to its portrayal on most cards. This artist, for example, says she modeled the town after historic Boston. Now check this out, another unique illustration from the second new region found in Wind from the Sea. The main locale this time is the ruins of a lost civilization that's sunken underwater, like Atlantis, with some other pieces still on land. In addition, several strange crop circles appear in grassy fields with no explanation. And lastly, a forest of colorful apricorn trees can be seen across these cards. But Wind from the Sea also contains the first unique human characters since Imposter Oak, named Traveling Salesman and Forest Guardian. This trend would continue into the third expansion, Split Earth, where we got Desert Shaman, Oracle, and Underground Expedition. This desert setting is home to more allusions to ancient wonders, like this Stonehenge-esque rock circle and a ho -Oh geoglyph much like the Nazca Lines. But the title of Split Earth refers to this massive rift in the terrain, which is only visible in two cards, but inside the rift is a cave system and underground lake. 
The desert also contains a crater of unknown origin, where an oasis and small village are seen at the base. And there's more artifacts around the area, like these cave drawings, charms, and mystery plates. The fourth and final e-card set is Mysterious Mountains, which has an interesting fan theory surrounding it. Some English fans believe that the equivalent wizard set Sky Ridge is based on Pokemon the Movie 2000, so let's go over the evidence. In the movie, a wealthy collector named Lawrence III seeks to capture Zapdos, Moltres, and Articuno with his giant airship in order to summon the fourth legendary Pokemon, Lugia. And what do you know, Moltres and Articuno appear in Sky Ridge, flying around what looks to be an airship. And while Zapdos only appears in Aquapolis, the illustration depicts it flying away from lightning attacks, very similar to how Zapdos was captured in the movie. In addition, Ash Ketchum and friends visit three mountainous islands, which are home to the legendary birds, but also these fire, ice, and lightning orbs they must collect from shrines. It just so happens that Sky Ridge contains three mountains as well, and three miracle spheres, which represent the same elements, and ancient temples with statues of the legendary birds. And to top it off, at the end of the movie, this girl plays a song to revive Lugia, standing in the middle of a huge rock circle. And you know where we've seen that before. So there's seemingly multiple pieces of evidence pointing to some link between Sky Ridge and the second Pokemon movie, but is it true? Well, it may appear plausible on the surface, but only from the English side, where much of the context was lost. Originally, it was clear that these four sets were all showing parts of an entirely new continent. We even have a map of where each expansion and landmark is located, again from the Trainers Magazine. Town on no map to the east, wind from the sea to the south, split earth to the west, and mysterious mountains to the north. And all those coincidental references to the movie are at best vaguely inspired by it years later, and otherwise just that, coincidences. First of all, taking one look at the pack art for Mysterious Mountains reveals not an airship, but a spiral temple. This temple and the ruins around it are the location for many cards, including the bird shrines. As for Zapdos, although it's only one English set apart, it's three sets apart in Japan, and as you'll see later, this lightning is actually being drawn from the power plant. The same goes for the rock circles, which are originally from the set before, and shaped differently, and in the middle of a desert. The only plausible one to me are the Miracle Spheres, which are undeniably referencing the legendary birds. However, the set already has a sphere motif, embodied by the Mystery Zone Stadium. They could also be viewed as an analog to Split Earth's Mystery Plates. But Mysterious Mountains contains even more than that, at the base of the titular mountains, there's an abundance of geothermal activity, resulting in hot springs and geysers covering the landscape. There's even a series of waterfalls likely leading up the mountain, although it's hard to confirm. The map showing the whole continent doesn't note the locations of landmarks for this set, so it's unclear if we ever see what's on the mountains themselves. Nevertheless, they dominate the surrounding landscape, visible in at least 25 other cards from all four sets around the continent. But even after all this, there's still some mysteries left unsolved. For example, the map lists two additional locations in Wind from the Sea that go virtually unseen. The first is a water spring, which may correlate to these cards, but in a region centered around water, they could be anywhere. The other is just a big tree, and again, there's already an apricorn forest in this set, but maybe one of these is supposed to show it. Lastly, there's a small unnamed village from Mysterious Mountains, distinct from the abandoned ruins. You can see it on the back cover of Trainers Magazine Volume 18, which shows the legendary birds flying around the area at winter time. Uh. Two more unique supporter cards also make an appearance. Relic Hunter, exploring the ruins, and Apricorn Maker, in a workshop presumably in this town. Well, the E-Series adventure ends here. But now that you're familiar with its distinctive geography, I think you'll appreciate this last surprise I've been saving. 
These are Japanese-only TV commercials showing the locations and artwork from each of the four sets, and I'm just gonna play them here, cause I was amazed when I first saw the cards come to life like this. Generation 3 of the card game introduced the EX series, which in Japan is divided into the ADV era and the PCG era. The ADV era is pretty standard theme-wise, with highlights being Team Magma vs Team Aqua and EX Sandstorm, which prominently features the new desert biome. But it's also interesting for another reason. The size of the Japanese version, Miracle of the Desert, is 53 cards but the English version is almost double that at 100. Now it was and still is common for English sets to incorporate Japanese exclusive promo cards, mini sets, or pre-constructed deck cards into our normal sets. This is the case for the first EX expansion, Ruby and Sapphire. But Sandstorm is different. Upon release, these 50 additional cards simply didn't exist in Japan, which is never the case for set cards. A few months later, they would emerge in Japan's Team Magma vs Aqua set, and these Latios and Latios theme decks. So did the cards just get pulled from these upcoming products and placed in the English sets? Well, no, definitely not, because take a look at the setting in these new artworks. Somehow, an entire second half of Sandstorm themed cards were made for English alone, which is extremely bizarre. I'd love to know the story here, but no concrete evidence has surfaced as of now. But the PCG era would take things up a notch, starting with Fire Red and Leaf Green composed of Gen 1 Pokemon, then EX Deoxys based on the movie, then Team Rocket Returns reintroducing Dark Pokemon, then Unseen Forces known in Japan as Golden Sky Silvery Ocean which featured Gen 2 Pokemon, and then EX Delta Species This may be the most well-known piece of exclusive Pokemon card lore, as the type-altering effects are hard to miss. But this story actually starts in EX Legend Maker, which was initially released before Delta Species and named Mirage Forest. Supposedly, this forest is home to the elusive Mew, and in an attempt to find it, scientists established a city at the center of the forest called Holon, and built the Holon Research Tower, which sought to track Mew's location using electromagnetic radiation waves. However, these wave experiments caused the region's Pokémon to react and mutate into all kinds of abnormal types, and thus, in the next expansion, Delta species were born. Like in the E-series, Pokémon from the Holon region are shown against several common backdrops to establish the setting. Holon City is clearly inspired by classical Greek and Roman architecture, which I really dig. There's Pokémon swimming in water ducks, climbing the dome-shaped buildings, and exploring the central research tower, which many more cards retain in their backgrounds. Mechanic-wise, pre-evolution Pokémon possess purely their Delta type, but final evolutions become dual metal type, likely another effect of the tower. There's also Holon's Pokémon, which can transform into special energy cards and attach to your other Pokémon. Even the set's supporter cards feature new human characters that inhabit the region, like these scientists and farmers. Next is EX Holon Phantoms, which returns to Mirage Forest, only now most of the Pokémon there have evolved into new Delta species. 
but we also visit Holon Lake at the edge of the forest, with these jagged rocks off the coastline and a mysterious monument at its center. EX Crystal Guardians takes us even farther from Holon City and onto a strange remote island where large colorful crystals grow in abundance. Pokemon are seen biting at the waterfront or climbing the volcanic mountain range further inland. And the trainer cards feature yet more intriguing artifacts. But beyond this island, at the far reaches of Holon, lies a series of rugged mountainous islands, explored in the final EX expansion, Dragon Frontiers. More weird delta types, ancient relics, and a distant mountain peak that appears even more consistently than the ones in the E series. If the skyline is visible, it's probably there somewhere. But the base of the mountain is always covered by clouds, and it's not obvious why until seeing this card. It turns out this is actually a floating island, and it's not just a one-off artistic decision either. Several other cards, including this Typhlosion and the Japanese pack art itself, confirm the island is somehow airborne. But again, the contents of the island remain unknown. And that's pretty much it for the Holon region. I really tried to find any additional information to fill in the blanks here, but there's just nothing. The trainer's magazines that were invaluable to demystifying the E-series had ended production by 2003, and the press material that did turn up wasn't much help. But as I looked further, I realized it's even worse than that, because I've already given you some straight up false information. See, the only sources I could find for half of this stuff are English fan wikis, which is immediately a red flag. This Bulbapedia article, for example, contains nearly all the alleged information that's been floating around for years, so let's set the record straight. Or at least straighter. First of all, the whole article is worded very vaguely, and any information that isn't directly from card artwork or the text on booster packs has zero sources. For example, apparently Pokemon just evolved into Delta species in some places, and these random stadium cards from EX Dragon and Hidden Legends are somehow showing the Holon region's weather? Sure, why not? But don't show this weather card that's actually on the Crystal Guardian's island. But then there's the claim that Holon City is located within Mirage Forest, or that the set itself is related to Holon in the first place. This is by far the most ridiculous assertion here, and is backed up by literally nothing except pointing out the trees around the city and saying that's Mirage Forest. But wait, doesn't Hole on Phantoms take place in the forest too? And look, that Mew the scientists were searching for is here too. Alright, well let's count all the Pokemon that appear across both sets, since apparently they're the same location. There's evolution lines for Flygon, all five of the fossil Pokemon, and that's it. 12 out of 52 cards. And if that still seems high, keep in mind that fossil Pokemon are almost always printed alongside each other, since their unique evolution mechanics need to be accounted for. This also happened in sets like Fossil, Sky Ridge, Platinum Arceus, Fates Collide, Team Up, so yeah, I don't think this instance is very significant. Also, notice how Mew is missing from this list. That's because both the Mew and Mew EX cards were only in the English Holon Phantoms, and never part of the Japanese set. If we ignore these added English cards, the real setting of Holon Lake becomes more clearly defined. But what about that whole thing with the scientists building the Holon Research Tower specifically to find Mew? Uh, I have no idea where this comes from either. In fact, in the Japanese commercial for Mirage Forest, it shows a helicopter chasing after Mew. And there's no mention of Holon or the Research Tower before the release of EX Delta Species, which would be illogical and incongruent with how other connected sets have always worked if they were truly related. But that does raise the important question of what the Research Tower is for, and how it even works. This is a trickier one to answer, but there are some key pieces of evidence, like this Japanese ad for Delta Species. Before finding this, I was actually questioning whether the research tower even caused the type changes, but this seems to confirm it. Power. 
ポケモンカードゲームコロンの研究と登場 But beyond that, I couldn't find any more material to gain answers from. So, working with what we know, here are my theories for everything the Hoenn region could possibly be hiding. Let's start with the name Hoenn itself. In philosophy, a Hoenn is something that's both complete on its own and a part of something bigger, like a Pokemon card that's meaningful by itself but also functions as part of a larger deck. What are the implications of this for the Holon region? Well, think about each of the areas we visited so far a science driven city, a lakefront, a crystal beach, and a floating island. What do these have in common? About nothing. Except they're all part of a larger whole, the Delta species. I'm proposing the phenomenon may have originated independently from each area's unique shrines. Depicted in the set stadium cards and possessing curious effects. Dragon Frontiers features Holon Legacy, which appears to be an ancient megalith in the shape of a triangle. Its Japanese name is Holon's Holy Site, which supports the idea that this thing was man made. Also, every Pokemon from this set is Delta species, but the stadium's effect isn't necessarily a benefit to them, so I'm not sure what to make of that. The other set with all Delta species Pokemon is Holon Phantoms, which hosts another triangular monument resting in Holon Lake. This triangle motif isn't a coincidence, but what it implies is kind of unclear. It's likely referencing the Greek letter Delta but in uppercase, as the lowercase is the symbol for Delta species. In science, Delta is used to represent change or difference, which fits the idea of Delta species perfectly. But it could go one step further and imply the uppercase is the source or cause of the change and the lowercase is the result. But Pokemon has another association with triangles, and it just so happens that four of them are in this set Deoxys. A Pokemon with a triangle on its back and a sphere in its chest that first appeared on a triangular island in the form of a triangle? This has to mean something, right? Well, you'd think so, but out of all four artworks, none of them show that monument in Holon Lake, just the jagged mountains around it. But then there's the Japanese booster packs, with Deoxys and the lake front and center. But without any evidence, all we can do is speculate. Either way, check out the effect on the stadium card. It gives all Delta Pokemon the attack Delta Call, which searches for another Delta Pokemon from your deck. Does this mean it's some sort of summoning beacon? Who's building these things? Of course, Holon City has the research tower, but that's definitely a modern development. I think whoever first discovered the secret of Delta species are the same people who built these monuments to facilitate them, and the ones who left these ruins. This stadium card names them explicitly, but in Holon Phantoms, several Pokemon plus Holon Adventurer feature ruins in their backgrounds, chiefly this giant spherical object with several runes and holes on it. Any of these sites could have served as a blueprint for scientists attempting to recreate this technology and even harness its power. However, the effects of the research tower seem a bit different from the other Holon relics. This brings us to a third interpretation of the triangular patterns, and you may have noticed it already. It's the symbol for metal energy. The research tower and Holon Lake Shrine are near perfect matches, and the effect of the former literally turns other energy cards into metal. This card uses the metal symbol despite not even dealing with energy. Also, note the frequency of dual metal type Pokemon from set to set. In EX Delta species, every single fully evolved Delta Pokemon is also metal type, but in Hole on Phantoms, this number shrinks to only 9. Crystal Guardians has just 3 dual metal types, and by Dragon Frontiers, there are none. The farther from the research tower you go, the less metal types you get. It's also interesting that, with one exception, the tower's delta effect only seems to alter Pokemon who'd normally be colorless or already metal type in the card game. All other colors remain unchanged and just gain a secondary metal type, if they even become delta species at all. 
so it seems like this new experiment in Hoan City is producing a different kind of Delta Pokemon, perhaps even intentionally testing on select subjects. Which brings up yet another mystery. What are the Hoans Pokemon? They're not Delta species, yet Magnemite and Magneton are shown directly interacting with the research tower's electricity, which in all other instances is shown to turn a Pokemon into one. They're also being studied by Hoan scientists. Why? Are these what they're trying to recreate? Why is there a random Hoan's cast form in Hoan Phantoms? I mean, it sort of looks like a pair of energies. But there's actually a secret fourth meaning to the triangle. Okay, I'm kind of going crazy trying to make sense of all this. But there's still one more set we haven't talked about. Crystal Guardians has the stadium card Hole on Circle, but instead of releasing any sort of power, it seems to be suppressing other powers. In fact, all of the crystal-based artifacts are doing the same, turning off abilities, nullifying special energy, and ignoring color types. This set also happens to contain the fewest Delta species Pokemon by far, with a mere 8. So it's safe to say these crystals are some sort of naturally occurring force that counters the Delta Force, or even acts in the opposite way and withdraws their abilities. And yes, I know these cards serve a gameplay purpose to counter popular strategies at the time, but I think it's still significant. It shows an interesting exception to the rule, a place where Delta Pokemon are an anomaly, and there's no evidence of human involvement. So yeah, there's a lot left to figure out about the Hoan region, and I've tried to connect as many dots as I could. But I think we're still missing part of the story. It may be obscured by language barriers, or simply not on the internet, but there is one clue, and you've been looking at it this whole time. Where does this image come from? It's obviously a render of Hoan City, which looks like a Pokeball by the way, and it's done by the same artist as these other cards, but it's not from a card, or a booster pack, or seemingly anything, it just exists. The best case would be it's from an old article giving an official explanation of the set's story or development, like the E-Series had. Maybe some lost media people would be interested in this? In any case, tell me your own theories about the Hoan region and Delta Species Pokemon. And if any new official info turns up, I'll be sure to pin it in the comments. So of course, after months of making this video, I go back on the archive for the Japanese Pokemon Card Trainers website, which is basically a successor to the Trainers Magazine, so it was kind of surprising that I couldn't find any real info on the Hoan region. Like, a lot of the articles are just descriptions of new products or whatever. But then I find this one article that's just an insane lore dump of the entire Delta Species set that's never mentioned anywhere else and isn't even documented anywhere outside of this. So yeah, this is gonna change quite a bit, and I would've just rewritten this whole part, but it's so late in the production process that, I'm sorry, I, I just can't do it guys, I've been editing every day for a month, I'm about to go insane. But I think this is too important to leave out or leave till the end, so I'm just gonna read the full article right now. This is translated, but it should be pretty accurate. Also, you'll notice that none of the images have been archived. There's a lot of stuff on this website, images and videos, that just don't exist anymore. That picture of Holon City probably comes from here. This is so embarrassing. This is connected to Mirage Forest, but just read it. Deep in Mirage Forest, there is a place called a Power Spot. It is said that Power Spots are filled with mysterious power, and when people visit them they are healed by the energy that flows through their bodies. To uncover the mysteries of the Power Spot, researchers came to this place and built a research village. The Power Spot and the research village came to be known as Holon. Again, this is never mentioned anywhere else, and it really seems like this was added retroactively. Like they made Legend Maker, and then decided, oh let's put Delta Species here, because like I said, there is nothing connecting the two sets. A powerful magnetic field is generated in Holon. One day, Pokemon living in and around Holon began to change. Pokemon began to have different types from their original types. The magnetic field power of Holon has brought out the sleeping power of Pokemon. 
Since this is the fourth discovery following Normal, EX, and Star, researchers have designated these Pokémon as Delta types. Well, that's disappointing. I can't believe that's the only reason for Delta types. There's too many other coincidences. But that's the official explanation, I guess. While studying Pokémon that have received magnetic field power, researchers discovered a completely new ability in Pokémon. It is the Holon Pokémon. A Holon Pokémon can change the energy in itself and become energy itself. However, there are very few Holon Pokémon, and they are said to be very precious. Okay, lastly, as a result of further research into Delta-type Pokémon and Holon Pokémon, they were able to create a new energy called Holon Energy. Holon energy is also called synthetic energy and is an energy that can be combined with basic energy to produce special effects. It is said that three types of Holon energy have been created that react to the combination of fire and fighting, water and psychic, and grass and lightning. So it's interesting that the scientists created this energy, which I kind of just assumed and didn't really think it was that important to include, but there you go. So, overall the biggest thing from this article is that, yes, it is connected to Mirage Forest, but not in the way that everyone seems to think for some reason. I really don't know where the Mew stuff came from. Back to the video. Well, the EX series was finally over. Or at least it was supposed to be, but presumably to fill a gap in releases before the new generation of Pokémon, we got EX Power Keepers. This is another odd situation like EX Sandstorm, as the set published overseas months before the Japanese version, and contained a plethora of brand new cards among the reprints and Japan exclusives. And this time, it's almost certain that they were designed for English first, as their source would later be revealed as this World Champions Pack, which was just a one-to-one -one reprint of Power Keepers. It was only available online, and only produced to give Japanese players the new cards for the 2007 World Championships, hence the name. This makes it the first instance of perfect congruency between regions since Neo Destiny. Anyway, these new cards are based on the Hoenn region's Elite Four, including all their Pokémon and their titular Stadium cards, but that's as far as it goes. Okay, now the EX series was over, and Pokémon sets would chill out for a while in Gen 4. The Diamond and Pearl games introduce snow-covered routes and wintry areas like Snowpoint City, so you'll occasionally see this reflected in the artwork, along with the typical game references. But the sixth set, Legends Awakened, has a noticeable spring theme, which in Japan is often symbolized by their pink cherry blossom trees. Conversely, two sets later in Platinum, there's a nice autumn theme. The Platinum era also brought back owner's Pokémon, in the form of Pokémon SP, specifically Team Galactic's Pokémon for the first set, as its Japanese name is Galactic's Conquest. But the following sets would introduce Gym Leader's Pokémon, Elite Four's Pokémon, this is a Japanese four, Champion's Pokémon, and Frontier Brain's Pokémon. Japan also got these exclusive movies Pokémon to accompany the 12th Pokémon movie, Arceus and the Jewel of Life. The final Platinum set, Advent of Arceus, was released alongside it, and besides featuring 9 different level 100 Arceus cards of each type, you can spot a solar eclipse motif, which signaled in the movie that Arceus was returning to the Pokémon world. Platinum Cards also introduced a new mechanic called the Lost Zone, which is a sort of parallel to the Distortion World from the Platinum game, but kinda has its own thing going on. We'll see more of that in the last Gen 4 card series, Heart Gold and Soul Silver. Known as the Legend Era in Japan, it runs with the traditional Japanese influences of the Johto games, like the historical architecture, which manifests in the various houses, shrines, and towers found across the region. However, this is noticeably absent from one particular set, HS Unleashed. You know the drill by now, let's investigate. Unlike Sandstorm or Power Keepers, Unleashed has no Japanese equivalent and seemingly materialized out of nowhere. In reality, it's an amalgamation of seven different pre-constructed decks that never left Japan. The first four are these Battle Starter decks, 30 cards each and themed around different strategies. There's Torterra for defense, Magmortar for attack, Blastoise for technique, 
and Raichu for speed. Plus, all the artwork takes place in an outdoor battle arena. Released simultaneously was the Leafeon vs Metagross Expert deck, which came with two full decks, plus a CD-ROM that let users access a new web-based app called Pokemon Card Game Online. Players could only use a handful of constructed decks to enter battles or tournaments, and the service ran for less than a year before shutting down. I would say it was replaced by Pokemon Trading Card Game Online, but it kind of wasn't. Over the game's entire 12-year lifespan, it was never officially released in Japan, nor was a Japanese language option ever added. And this is still true for its successor, Pokemon TCG Live, so they're just forced to play it in English. I don't know, I just found that kind of weird. But yeah, this experiment with a digital game simulator explains the complete juxtaposition between the traditional main series and these cyberspace-themed expert decks. Lastly are the Steelix and Tyranitar Constructed Standard decks, published a few months later. The artwork for the Steelix deck is set in Goldenrod City, specifically around the Goldenrod Radio Tower. And the Tyranitar deck takes place in Ecruteague City, and features the Tin Tower, or Bell Tower. Only Steelix and Tyranitar's card lines were taken for Unleashed though, the rest went toward the next set, Undaunted. But this assortment of decks was enough to form the core of a real set, even possessing a good type distribution, which probably isn't a coincidence. But it was still missing some key elements, mainly Pokemon Prime and Pokemon Legend. So all of these cards were either taken forward from Undaunted, or preemptively held back from the first Heart Gold expansion. This resulted in the latter having 20 fewer cards than the Japanese equivalent, when usually the opposite is true. So that's how HS Unleashed was created in 7 days. I mean, with 7 decks. But there's another mystery within Heart Gold and Soul Silver. The last two expansions, HS Triumphant and Call of Legends, are usually aligned with the series aesthetics, but then there's these cards that completely stick out. Dark atmospheres, highly detailed 3D renders, and the return of the Lost Zone mechanic. As it turns out, these come from a small Japanese subset called Lost Link. While the Lost Zone was introduced in Platinum, it was never visually depicted until now, and fortunately, there's some unique lore hiding in here. Unfortunately, there is not a single advertisement, extra artwork, or even description to go off of. The only clues are within these 40 cards, so let's dissect them. Lost Link seems to be set on a lone island rising up from the sea. This is seen most clearly on Altaria and Research Record. Most of the island appears heavily forested, which is the backdrop for the majority of cards. There's also a lake at the center, where the few water Pokémon likely come from. And at the edges of the island, several large pointed mountains jut out from the ground. Oh, and above that is a giant swirling vortex that leads to the Shadow Realm. Again, without any outside sources, the origins and powers of the Lost Zone are up in the air. But it seems like this lost energy can be harnessed by Pokémon themselves, as seen in these illustrations. There's also four trainer cards that deal directly with the Lost Zone. Besides research record, there's the item Lost Remover. You'd think this would be some cursed artifact that sends things into the Lost Zone, but then there's the supporter card Seeker, who's wearing the Lost Remover while exploring the island, so it could be removing the lost energy instead and protecting its possessor. Either way, the Seeker is definitely connected to the research record as well. There's the leaves from the forest on its pages, and Seeker's Japanese name translates to Researcher or Investigator. The final card is the stadium Lost World, portraying a cataclysmic storm tearing apart the island and sucking it into the abyss. When enough of your opponent's Pokémon have been sent there, you can use this card to instantly win the game. This was the Pokémon TCG's first alternate win condition, and it's very fitting. The Lost Zone theming would return whenever the mechanic was prominently featured, like Lost Thunder from Sun and Moon, and Lost Origin from Sword and Shield. But it's never come close to this level of immersion again.
On a related note, every card with a Pokemon using this Lost Energy Sphere was used for Call of Legends instead of Triumphant, but that was probably just an aesthetic choice over any lore implications. But Call of Legends is curious in its own right. It's another English-only set, and technically isn't even part of the Heart Gold series, similar to Wizards' unique reprint set, Legendary Collection. Call of Legends is also mostly a reprint set, plus some unreleased Japanese promos and the Lost Link cards. However, every single reprinted Pokémon received a new illustration. For most of them, the same Japanese illustrators went back and drew alternate versions of their original art exclusively for this English set. These were very likely developed out of unused concept sketches from the initial card planning process, due to just how similar they look. But other types of art that likely weren't conceived in this way, like 3D renders and Sugimori stock art, were completely redone by new artists. Although we've gotten many more alternate art reprint sets after Call of Legends, none have been completely English exclusive or redrawn slightly differently by the same artists like this, making for a pretty unique moment in the series' history. Although Gen 5 marks a complete tonal shift for the TCG, it embodies an overall trend we're seeing of the card games world looking more and more like the video games. The Black and White series was especially devoted to this, and while exploring in-game locations is a type of lore like I said, I don't find it nearly as interesting as dissecting some unique region we've never seen before. But I'm sure other people disagree, so here's what I'm gonna do. There is one more region exclusive to the card game, but I'm gonna save it till the end so we can run through all of the game and movie connections first, starting from Black and White all the way to Scarlet and Violet. That way, if you see something that interests you, you can look up the sets and cards for yourself to find out more. And if you really know your TCG history, you might catch what I'm leaving out. The first few black and white expansions are just based on generic routes from across the games. The fourth set, Next Destinies, is in Castelia City and the areas around it, while Dark Explorers is focused on Twist Mountain and Chargestone Cave. Then, Japan got Dragon Vault, a mere 20-card subset that first added the Dragon type to the card game. In English, though, we got the next main expansion, Dragon's Exalted, first. This set extensively shows the inside and outside of N's castle, which, spoilers, rises from underground and attaches to the Unova Pokémon League. After Boundaries Crossed, which introduced elements from the Black 2 and White 2 games, we got several sets based around Team Plasma, specifically their new headquarters, the Plasma Frigate. The first was Plasma Storm, but the next set, Plasma Freeze, is where their plot to cover the world in ice is truly realized. In the games, only Opelucid City was frozen by the Plasma Frigate, but here we're given a timeline where Team Plasma was much more successful and locations from across the region are shown to be affected. But their plan still fails in the end, and by Plasma Blast, the ice is receding and Team Plasma is losing their hold on Unova. Moving on to X and Y, there's actually a lot of interesting stuff here, including some unique lore right off the bat. The third set, Furious Fists, is all about a Pokémon tournament, not a gym battle with trainers, an actual martial arts slash wrestling tournament for just Pokemon. You can spot five different arenas across the artwork, including Training Center, Fighting Stadium, and Mountain Ring, which was featured in the most cards. There's also a European-style street plaza, complete with tournament brackets posted on boards beside the stage. Look at this Beartic destroying this Galurk. This is insane. There's a beach background that barely goes used in the set, but we still know about it thanks to an article in this book, the Pokemon Trading Card Game Illustration Collection. In it, the design team at Creatures Inc. explain the creative process behind several expansions, including Furious Fists, revealing unseen concept art and drafts of its illustrations. Also, according to the concept notes, fighters who've made it through the battles in each region convene at the fighting stadium for the final matches. This makes me wonder how many other behind-the-scenes details like this we'll simply never know. 
With the mid-gen release of Omega Ruby and Alpha Sapphire, we got the main expansion Primal Clash, but also the subset Double Crisis, which portrays members of Team Magma and Team Aqua in a struggle to infiltrate the other secret base. Not only is the art on point, but the flavor text isn't your standard Pokedex entry either, and instead features a Magma or Aqua Grunt commenting on their Pokémon's unique strengths. This is the closest the game's ever come to those unique card descriptions found in Magic the Gathering and many other TCGs, and sure enough, it adds a lot of charm and intrigue. Also, several of these Pokémon's effects reference their debuts in EX Team Magma vs Aqua over a decade prior. The next two sets, Roaring Skies and Ancient Origins, are themed more loosely, but you can still spot some locations from the Gen 3 games. Steam Siege is yet another set based on the latest Pokémon movie, which this time was Volcanion and the Mechanical Marvel. But besides featuring Volcanion and Magearna, the steam and gear-powered city in the card artwork is markedly different from the movie's counterpart, the Azoth Kingdom. The English booster packs call it the Gear Palace, and apparently Mega Gardevoir EX is laying siege to it, but that's all we get in terms of lore. Now it gets bad. For whatever reason, the Sun and Moon series wasn't interested in the video game lore, or any new exclusive lore, and instead opted for no lore. The artwork is great as always, don't get me wrong, but the set as a whole just lacks identity. You'll occasionally see some game references or connected cards, but they're not nearly common enough to form an overall theme. Even when new Pokémon or new mechanics are introduced, the cards around them seem unaffected. You can basically take all the Sun and Moon Pokémon, shuffle them into a big pile, and divvy them out again, and it'd feel the exact same. Sword and Shield is only slightly better in this regard. Take Vivid Voltage, for example. You've got your Amazing Rares and your Lightning Engines. Beyond that, every other card in the set looks the same as usual. Why not show other types of Pokémon encountering lightning in some way, or invent a new colorful set piece or mysterious object for them to explore? In reality, each set's theme is usually just derived from meta-defining cards or flashy gimmicks. This is certainly nothing new for the game, but it's feeling increasingly more common, and after 25 years of non-stop Pokémon, these generic cards are starting to run together, while the unique locations continue to stand out. A possible reason for doing this is to give each individual set more variety, which is nice to experience the first few times, but the end result is an entire series with no identity. If we go back to that pile of cards and just sort them into themes, like beach, city, forest, mountain, etc., it already feels more cohesive, even with no real connection between them. And then when you think of the set, you'll say, oh, that's the tropical one, or I liked all the cities. You don't even have to change the art, just simply group them better and you've made a way more memorable and interesting product. When truly done right, each card serves to not only show you the Pokémon's perspective, but also reveal parts of their world piece by piece, building up the impression of something greater, something you want to explore and hunt for clues in other cards. This combination of characters, artwork, and mechanics is an experience unique to this card game format, so why not take advantage of it? Alright, there are some points of interest here. Throughout the Sword and Shield series, you'll see Pokémon hanging around a circular park area that doesn't seem to match any area in the games. Well, almost three years later, Japan would get the promo card Peaceful Park, which confirmed this was indeed a new location. If the Furious Fists article is anything to go by, this is likely the original concept art that other artists would have used as a reference. But my favorite cards from this recent era are those based on Pokémon Legends Arceus. The first set to do this was Astral Radiance, and wow, it's like entering another dimension. Almost every card incorporates the game's unique biomes, landmarks, or visual aesthetics into its illustrations to an unparalleled degree. It may not technically be anything new, but poring over these cards really gives you a different perspective on the Hisui region, and for me, a nostalgic one. You can find more Legends-inspired cards in the Japanese expansion Dark Phantasma, which released as a subset of their Astral Radiance, 
but the theming isn't as pervasive, and it was merged with several other products for our English set Lost Origin, so it's easy to overlook. So yeah, it seems like the days of exclusive lore in the TCG are unfortunately over. Oddities like the E-Series Mysterious Continent, EX's Holon region, and even the Lost World are far in the past now. But do you notice a pattern? All of these unique locations have come at the tail end of their generation. When all the well-worn tropes and video game references have run their course, we seem to get some new and interesting ideas instead. And sure enough, this pattern holds true for one last time. The X and Y Break series really demonstrates the narrative potential of the modern card game. Like the Holon series, they didn't just introduce a new mechanic, they designed an entire storyline along with it. This time, the plot revolves around two parallel worlds, one of nature and one of technology. While the former hosts a traditional town, home to rural architecture and undisturbed wildlife, the latter has urbanized and expanded into a fully-fledged metropolis. This sounds like something out of Pokemon Black and White, but it's actually based on Mewtwo's Mega Evolutions. The first set, Breakthrough, was originally the dual sets Blue Shock and Red Flash, each representing a different world. Mega Mewtwo X, with its blue eyes and strong physical stats, symbolized the past timeline of Blue Shock. But the red eyes Mega Mewtwo Y, with its heightened mental abilities, represents the future timeline in Red Flash. Nearly all cards display this dichotomy in some way, and even Pokemon from one timeline can have direct counterparts in the other. But something strange is happening here. Off the shores of each world's island city, a rift in space-time is growing, and the two Mega Mewtwo's from different timelines soon violently encounter each other, opening the first portal between worlds. In the next set, Breakpoint, or Rage of the Broken Heavens in Japan, this shiny Mega Gyarados first discovers the portal, apparently, and not only is it getting wider, but smaller rifts are forming across the area. For some reason, though, they scaled the theming way back, and only a few cards actually show this. This might be the fault of Generations and Radiant Collection, two unrelated sets that came out in the middle of the Break series, causing it to unfortunately lose focus. But the story continues, and in Fates Collide slash Awakening of the Psychic King, Mega Alakazam vows to end the chaos and merge the two clashing timelines into one. This unification is embodied by Chaos Tower, where the trees and skyscrapers once opposite each other are now entangled in a post-apocalyptic-esque city. You can see the striking aftermath of the merger in various forms, and it's a pretty cool aesthetic. Besides the stadiums, though, there aren't any unique trainer cards like the mysterious items and new supporter characters we've had in the past. Anyway, I do find it interesting that the designers seemingly held back some of the most popular Pokémon from the rest of the X and Y series to be used for this parallel world's lore. There's the Mewtwo's, Alakazam's, Gyarados's, and possibly the Zygarde forms, since I guess they helped restore order. Also, I have to give a shout out to Bulbapedia, because this is an example of a good article. Well researched, sourced from direct interviews, and containing some nice obscure promo art. Well, as of this video, it's been over 8 years since Fates Collide, and two whole generations later, another set like it has yet to be seen. But that may be changing soon. Scarlet and Violet are at least getting back to the video game locations, and I'm really enjoying them so far. Look, this card even replicates the low quality lighting. And with the recent announcement of Pokemon Trading Card Game Pocket, not only will we get new exclusive artwork, but also these immersive experiences that take you beyond the card frame and into the Pokemon's world like we've never seen before. I don't know, but to me, this just screams new lore potential, and I'm excited to see what the team of artists and designers can create without the limitations of video game tie-ins or even physical media. So, I think we should remain optimistic for the future of unique lore in the Pokemon trading card game.
In part 2, we'll explore the fascinating world of Pokemon card art and artists. Stay tuned, and thanks for watching.